Welcome back to the Abundant Culture Podcast, where business owners like you come to learn how to grow the valuation of their companies so they can sell in the future. On this show, you'll learn how to sell for top dollar and invest in profitable businesses around the country. Now, here are your hosts, Jazz and Joe. Welcome back to Abundant Culture Podcast. This week, we have Maceo Jordan, who is a serial entrepreneur with two decades of building businesses by creating great products and great marketing. He's taken a company from 25000 to $23 million in just under three years, and he's helped companies turn around. Maceo, welcome to Abundant Culture Podcast. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of the episode, I have to ask you, like, what's that, what's that backstory? Give us that entrepreneurial journey. Well, I really do have to start when I was a kid. Uh, I was delivering papers around our townhouse a complex, and I saw uh, that some of the ladies had bird feeders. Now, of course, as a, a kid, you have no idea what they are. You just know it's this plastic thing with red water in it. Um, and so I at the same time, was getting a magazine called Boy's Life. Now, I know I'm seriously dating myself here. <laughs> There's probably like three people listening to this that actually know, know what that is. Uh, but one of the cool things about that living in that time was there was a lot of stuff reinforcing entrepreneurship just in everyday life. And that was one example. Um, in fact, even in the back of comic books at the time, there were little ads for entrepreneurial stuff that kids could do. So anyway... Uh, one of the projects in Boy's Life was making bird feeders. I put two and two together, made this little device for these these women. They loved it because the birds loved it. Uh, it actually turned into a, a subscription business. So I, you know, I could I could probably claim to have like the first subscription business ever or something crazy like that. But um, being a you know a typical kid, I immediately abandoned it because it was too much work. Even though I was making, I mean, I was making gobs of money for a kid. You know, it was like. Anytime I wanted to go to the arcade, I could go. I was taking my friends, you know, it was like I was balling before that was even a thing. And of course, all the other kids wanted to hang out with me because when I would go, I mean, I'm a very generous person. I mean, I would just like, yeah, I had a whole, like a fistful of quarters, you know, and I had no idea how much money I was given. It was probably, you know, five, six bucks, which to a kid is, I mean, especially back then, that was a lot of money. So that's really where it started because I, for some reason, I really did pick up on the reality that if I found the buyer first, then everything else fell into place. And I, and I just distinctly remember it as a kid thinking that, you know, wow, if I find the buyers, then I don't have to worry about anything else. Yeah, you know, I didn't have to worry about unit costs or total addressable market because these people wanted what I had. That is a very wise piece of advice. I don't hear a lot of people say that. I think I've heard it one other time before. But I think it's something that takes a lot of the risk out of entrepreneurship when you already have a buyer in place. Uh, so it's yep. really cool that you did that. So tell us about how, you know, as a kid learning that, how that led to led up to everything that you're really doing now in your career today. You know, it's funny. I, I've, I've been asked that question a lot. I think I may have just realized the real answer. I think it removed the the big fear of the unknown. Right? So, I mean, I've coached entrepreneurs for a long time. I mean, I legitimately have coached thousands of people one-on-one. It was brutal work. It's like 14 hours a day, you know, 10 minutes at a time where, you know, I'm talking to them, but then also following up via email. I had a whole staff supporting me. Um, you know, so I can't say it's possible, but like if anybody's doing the math, like you're going to find out I was spending a lot of money in support staff and I was working my tail off. Uh, so, I think most people, when, when they're thinking about some sort of entrepreneurial journey, they don't know a lot of the answers and their brain is going to tell them. And I, I, I word it that way. It sounds strange when I say it that way. Um, but my experience of life is, you know, there's sometimes where it's like, wow, I'm feeling a little weird about this and I don't know why. Right? So what I've learned over the years is that's, that's the machinery in my brain telling me, hey, watch out, something may eat you if you keep going in that direction. And so you know, entrepreneurs, especially if they're coming out of a corporate environment, uh, or maybe they're, you know, they've been just working and, and saving their money, and they're thinking, okay, now I'm going to go launch. Well, when, when you 
authentically say that, right? Because we, we all know that there's some people who always talk about doing something and they never do anything, right? Yeah. Uh, it's like, it's old, this uh, Will Smith line from the, the first men in black, you know, don't start nothing, won't be nothing. Yeah. Uh, I, I say that to my kids all the time. Well, when you <laughs> start something, what, what the character was saying in that, in that moment was when you commit fully to do something, there's going to be something else, right? Yeah. I know that sounds really, you know, cheesy and maybe country, but man, I mean, that's how we experience it. Yeah. We can talk all day long about being the next Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, or I'm going to do this and that. Well, wake up one day and write a check. And all of a sudden you're going to feel like physically different. If you talk to you a neuro, neurobiologist, they're going to tell you why. And basically it's just your brain is now bringing into gear all of that machinery that's there to protect you. And so the fear and anxiety, what lies behind that are probably some good ideas. But I think because at an early age, it's like, well, hey, if, if I get the buyers, I don't have to worry about like this big chunk of stuff. Then my brain no longer had to feed me those fear signals for the unknown. Yeah, that's a good point. So when <laughs> entrepreneurs are going through that, like how do you guide them through that anxiety and that fear? Because, you know, one, one of the things I've always been curious about, and I think it's because I haven't, I, I didn't have the same entrepreneurial journey as some people. It wasn't like, you know, a lot of people, they have this great job, but they want to do their own thing. There was no great job for me. So it kind of <laughs> felt like I didn't have any choice. So like the fear and anxiety, I just had to learn how to like deal right. with it. Whereas with a lot of other people, they have a backup plan and their backup plan is kind of nice. They might be making, you know, you know, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year or more in their job. And they feel like they can just always go back to that. How does an entrepreneur um, fully commit when that's the backup plan and plan A is just honestly scary as hell? You know, oh boy, I've, I've got a lot to say along these lines. So if you if you listen to people from the stage, and I love pointing fingers, so you have to you have to forgive me. So if you look at a Tony Robbins, a Gary V, Simon Sinek, you know, anybody that's on a stage at PS selling you stuff, you know they're going to have one particular message, and that message is you know burn the boats. Well, the first question I ask is, okay, well when was the last time you personally did that? Um, and you actually find that a lot of these people have never done it. Uh, you also find that a lot of these people have never really led organizations. Um, not that they can't, you know, spout information that's correct, but when you're when you really want to learn something, you want to learn from somebody who's gone through it. And so there's a concept in ancient Greek. It's all through the the New Testament, and there's a it's a different kind of knowledge that's a knowledge based on experience. You know, we have cliches. You know, those who can't teach. That's true to a point. Um, but the, the ask, what I would tell them is born out of having gone through it. So yeah. this is probably not going to sound a lot like what you hear, you know, from the Simon Sinek and Gary V's and Tony Robbins of the world, because it's not about, you know, devising some great technique. It's, it's realizing number one, it's going to suck. Uh, and so that's a, you know, if you look at any elite, you know, military team, they have a similar phrase, which is embrace the suck. Well, what does that mean? It means it's a natural part of what you're doing. And so really the, the people who try and tell entrepreneurs anything else are doing them a disservice because then what winds up happening is you go into it and you're thinking, man, this feels like it sucks. You're looking around and then you hear these people on the stage basically saying, well, if it sucks, it means you're doing something wrong. Or if it sucks, buy this thing I'm selling in and it won't suck anymore. And so then you buy it and it still sucks. And you're like, okay, what's going on? They say, well, you didn't use it right or buy this add-on, right? That's all, that's the shtick. When instead we should be telling them, look, this is going to suck. You're going to be afraid. You're not going to know what's going to happen. And as a result, you are designed, your body is designed to give you signals. When you feel like throwing up before speaking, that's natural, right? You should, because your, your body is literally trying to give you more resources, right? You don't want to be digesting a big lunch when your brain's got to work. Well, throw it up, right? Your body doesn't, like there's no half measures. So, you know, there, there's, there are these real things that, that, we, that we experience as entrepreneurs that are a normal part of it. And so I would, I would say just that, embrace the suck. Realize that you're going to wake up, you're going to be afraid, you might not be sleeping right, uh, you know, you may be irritable, but also then, you know, try and communicate that. I mean, you've got a partner there next to you. So it's like having that open conversation 
uh, and also, you know, if, if, uh, if someone's getting into entrepreneurship and maybe their spouse or significant other isn't as committed, just communicating to them or maybe, you know, pointing them to this podcast, just that that, that individual is going to be irritable. Like you can't avoid it. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to be swinging from huge adrenaline to high cortisol. And that swing is, it's going to make you pissed off. Yeah. So bring them a sandwich. You know what I mean? It's like, give them a hug. Not that you let them off the hook if they're doing it too much. Let's not, you know, we don't have to turn this into a marriage counseling session, but it's just like, that's all part of it. Right. And so we've got this really weird, uh, we've got this really weird perception of what entrepreneurship quote should be. But then, you know, there's a totally different side of it once people get in. And so I'll sum it up by saying this, what winds up happening is people think, wow, something must be wrong with me or something's broken inside of me because I'm feeling this way or because I'm, you know, I'm not succeeding as quickly or things aren't happening uh, fast enough. Now, there may be some, some tactical issues, uh, which I found, you know, is the case. But, but when you put tactical mistakes on top of feeling bad about feeling bad, uh, I mean, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot, you know, as soon as you get out of bed in the morning. And I love how honest you were about that answer, because <laughs> I, I think entrepreneurship lately, especially in the media, has been painted as this kind of glorious type of victorious type thing. Like and you work on the beach and you yeah. don't have to deal with anybody. Yeah, it's like... Like the four hour work week. I, that dude worked 80 hours a week to sell a book called the four hour work week. Uh, I don't think I need to say anything else. <laughs> right. And, and I think, you know, you get days like that where it's just effortless and easy. And, but it's after all of the crap that you well, hold, through for you. Let me, let me talk to that because that's, so I was a hedge fund trader for a long time. I was, and I was good at it. Yeah. Uh, and what I, what I, what I mean when I say that was for five years, there were, there was not a rolling 30 day period where I was in a continuous drawdown, right? So if on the first of the month, I started losing money by the 30th of the month, I had not only recovered the losses, but I had made a profit. Um, so that I'm just saying like, that speaks to the performance. What I learned, um, and I learned this early on as a trader is there's a difference between growing and scaling. I'll put it in entrepreneurship terms. When a company scales, the scaling is being done to it. Facebook isn't, wasn't growing for all those years. Facebook was scaling. Mm. What does that mean? It means that they had a technology in the right place at the right time that people sought them out. So what would be growth? Growth would be IBM. So IBM went from big blue, people walking around in you know blue suits and black ties. Everybody, it was their default to hey, well, wait a minute, why are we spending $5,000 on this IBM computer when there's this Hewlett Packard, you know, for 2000? And then the clones came in and then that went down to 1800 and even lower. So they lost that position. They had to, they were, went from scaling to growth. Growth takes effort. It takes active money. It takes energy or you have to put energy into the system to make it work. So here's with social media, what we wind up seeing and what's, what gets held up at these, as a paragon of success are companies that are scaling, right? So in the VC world, everybody's looking for a unicorn, right? Something that's worth a billion dollars, which by the way, who says it's worth a billion? The VCs do. So it's yeah. like, wait a minute. The, the people who are looking for the thing are now telling Same. you, yeah, right. It's, it's work. But yeah. nobody like, it's, it's weird. I, I just think it's weird that nobody like actually looks and calls this stuff out. Anyway, <laughs> uh, what, what those VCs are looking for is a company that's going to scale. That's right place, right time, baby. I mean, there's no way to get by it. It's no different than if I, so if I'm trading and I have a position on, if I buy it and it's not making money immediately, I sell it. Especially if I'm like, if I want profits over a really short term. Well, so think about that in the context of a business. If you, let's say you're a coffee business. If you make a cup of coffee, how long do you want that cup of coffee sitting on your counter? No time at all. Right. So in other words, you want somebody right there willing to buy it. Right. That is no different than what I was doing as a trader. If I bought copper, uh, you know, a currency, IBM, Apple stock, I wanted somebody else standing right there that's willing to buy it from me. Why? Because if I buy something, I have to sell it to someone willing to pay a higher price in a business is a price higher than my cost to put it together, you know, my COGS, advertising, all of my, all that stuff has to be factored in. In trading the same, 
so they've got to be willing to pay that price. Mm -hmm. So whatever, if I add all that up as a trader, what are my commissions cost to carry? I, that sets my limit. Okay. If I sell at this price and I break even and every penny above that is profit, it's no different in business. And so that if people miss that really simple equation, well, in something that's scaling, that's when you walk up to your, you know, figuratively your coffee shop and there's a line down the block. They're like, Hey, I've been waiting for like three hours. Where you been? Obviously that doesn't happen very often, which is why entrepreneurs have so much trouble. What they wind up thinking is that they either make the mistake of saying, everybody's going to want this, or they look and say, wow, everybody's lining up at Starbucks for coffee. All I have to do is open up one down the street and you know, I'm going to kind of siphon off of their success. That's not always the case. And because Starbucks is more scaling, right? People know about them and all yeah. that. They don't have to put that energy in, right? It doesn't cost them as much to acquire a customer. So because people miss this, like this basic concept, they're going to open up that competitor thinking they can siphon off some of the business, not realizing that their cost to get that buyer who's going to take that cup of coffee off their hands is higher than what they expected. So they start losing money. So that's, it's, 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 I think a byproduct, especially today of social media, it's really easy to just open up an app and get access to a company that's doing that. Where when I was coming up, man, I mean, you had the newspaper, you had magazines, you had TV news and that was it. Now I can, you know, grab my phone and I can, you know, find 10,000 people who claim to be making, you know, 10 million a month or something like that, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, back then you just, you, you wouldn't run into them. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've never heard anybody explain the difference between scale and growth. And I think sometimes we use them so interchangeably. Yeah. All that the time. Honestly, I thought they meant the same thing. Yeah. And <laughs> now that you explain that difference, I can be more strategic in the way that I go after what I thought was growth. But now I know that the real goal is scale. And I think anybody listening mm -hmm. to this, you've probably saved them from a bunch of, of mistakes because I know one thing I was, uh, I've never done anything in the VC world, but I was just curious about it. So I started researching it and I found out that there were a lot of companies that they were able to grow their user base, but they were, <laughs> they weren't able to do that profitably. And they I was were like, scaling. they were right, growing. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I love that you explain that. That's awesome. So I take, uh, that's another, this goes back, you know, to, to, you know, even in, into my childhood, I, I fell in love with physics at a fairly, fairly early age. Uh, I got accepted to MIT right out of the army and decided not to go, uh, which was probably a good thing. Uh, I, I don't know. I'd probably be a lab rat or something like that. <laughs> I wound up going to MIT and very unhappy. Um, so I, I have no problem taking something from a completely different arena and applying it to what I'm doing, number one. But number two, it, it, when you study physics, what you realize is that what works in one area, say biology, is will transfer over literally to everything else. And so my, my reasoning is important because it's, it's, because it's a new concept, I want to you know, give some kind of background. Well, if you, if you look at the way things happen here on planet Earth is... If they're growing, it takes a massive amount of energy, right? So when we were young, like my daughter is four years old, that kid probably sucks down 3000 calories a day. <laughs> Why doesn't she look like a blimp, right? Well, it's because she's going 90 million miles an hour. And more importantly, she's growing, right? So if we just have to look around and see everything on the planet that grows takes a massive amount of energy, right? So if you really think about our, just our sun, our sun should burn everything off the face of the earth. Well, why doesn't it? Well, it's blocked by the ozone layer, la, 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 la. But there's also a lot of stuff on the top of the planet, right? I.e. plants, buildings, this soaking that energy up. Well, all those plants soak that stuff up so that they can grow. They took, take stuff out of the soil so they can grow. There's nothing that grows without a massive energy input. Why would we think that we can grow a business without an energy input. Well, so what's that energy? Well, it's either going to be your energy, like literally your physical, mental, emotional energy. Because remember our brains, you can hook up electrodes to my noggin right here and see the signal, right? Mm -hmm. It's obviously producing energy. So when we say, well, I don't have energy for that, we are literally giving you, we're giving you information. So you can put your energy into it. So you can sweep floors or, you know, clean the toilets or cut the lawns or whatever you're doing. Or you can put your money in. 
Well, what's money? Money is just another storehouse of energy, right? It shows that you've either done something over here and gotten a huge return for that work, right? You know, in the case of like the unicorn. So you, you put your energy in, you get the unicorn, you get the exit, you know, now you've got the payday. You're going to be, you're going to be one of these VCs that you were talking about. Yeah. So they have managed to scrape up all that energy to put it into something. And this is why VCs are so exacting. It's why it's so difficult to get money from them is they understand this equation that it took a massive amount of energy from a lot of people to get that money into their bank account. So if they're going to put it into somebody else's bank account, they want to know if I put that energy in, what's the return, right? Am I putting yeah. energy in to grow grass? Well, that's fine if you want grass, but if I want, you know, a, a huge sequoia, which is probably why the VC firm named Sequoia named themselves that, you know, they're not after here for these little blades of grass. They're looking for that huge growth of Sequoia. They want to know if we put this energy in, are we going to get that huge return? Absolutely. So if an entrepreneur is thinking, okay, I'm, I want to approach VCs. You have to, you have to understand this equation that I'm talking about. And as crazy as it sounds, it really will work better for you if you communicate to VCs in that way, because you're acknowledging number one, it took a lot of work for them to get that money. And you as the entrepreneur realize that you're not just going to sit there and say, well, look, let's just throw some more money at it. Which, by the way, is how I, I gauge uh, the naiveness of an entrepreneur. If they say something like, well, I would have been successful if I would have had, you know, fill in number here. I know that they really don't get it. It's rarely truly down to a number. Like if I would have just had another million dollars, it's more that when they were putting their money into it, it was so inefficient had so many losses in the system, whether it's leaking out from payroll, you know, they never negotiated any of their contracts, that those are the reasons why. If you own a small business and you might be looking to sell, you could run into some major issues. Forbes estimates that nine out of 10 businesses listed never actually sell. Why? Because there's only one way to sell. You need to do these four steps first. So if you want to be a part of the 10% of businesses that sell for profits, we've created a free checklist for you so you can sell without those hurdles that normally hold you back. Download the free checklist by visiting www.abundantculture.co forward slash checklist. VCs don't like to, they don't want to sit here and talk for as long as I do. They want to talk in compressed, they want you to compress the information so that they don't have to think so much because they're, they're going through a thousand deals every, every couple of days, most of them. So when you understand that energy exchange uh, and you understand it in those terms, then you can start to think of all the ways that you, know, you can have money leaking out. Just like you know, if you had a leaky pipe or a leaky bucket, you know, if, if, if you wanted an exercise, if you fill up a plastic bucket with water and you take a, a, you know, a, a cheap one, right? go to Walmart and get a cheap plastic bucket, fill it up with water and Every time you can think of a cost or something that's going to take money out rather than put money in, poke a hole in it. And then look at your bucket. Like if you've got all of those leaks, you're, you have a visual representation, this real picture of all the things that you need to plug. And you can then take some, another cup and start pouring water into it and think, okay, you don't have to get super scientific about it, but just start pouring water in and see how fast you have to pour water into that bucket to overcome all of those leaks. That's exactly how a business works. And the, the ones that can plug as you know more of those leaks, you're going to have a business that can grow efficiently, right? So if you're talking about just putting more money in, that way a VC or, or an investor is going to know basically, okay, if I put a dollar in, I'm going to have, you know, 10 cents going for this and 20 cents going for that. And at the end of all of it, I'm going to have 10 cents left, left over for profit, which that may be good for them. Who knows? But that it will give you a way to, to get it into you. Yeah. Now, why did, I, why did I use that crazy example? Because you don't have to go start a business to do that. So what am I really talking about? Let, let me make it real. When human beings are talking, right? So we're on Zoom, we can see each other. We have mirror neurons, right? So we're, we're going to get signals from each other of what's going on internally. Yeah. So if, if I feel like I'm not confident or if I, you know, if, if I have this weird emotion, you're going to pick up on it. Now, yes, it's going to be in the micro expressions in our face, but it's also deeper than that, right? The, the, the neuroscientists that have done exercises on this have found it's a level of communication that goes beyond what's easy to describe. So when you're sitting in front of an investor and you are talking out, like I used to say in the, mil the military, out of the side of your neck, they're going to know, man. I mean, it's what we call it the BS detector, right? Yeah. So if you go through that exercise and you, 
experience that and you just put numbers to it. So you say, okay, for every ounce of water, that's going to be $100,000. And for every pin prick, that's going to be $10,000. And you write it down and, and you go to an investor and you say, well, I've got this business model, you know, here are all the leaks that are in the business. But if I put, you know, $100,000 in and then you figure out, okay, if I pour it for a second, that's a quarter, right? Three months, you can translate that real experience to this abstract idea of, hey, I've got this idea. So I'm telling you where, where most, especially people that are either coming up or they don't have a lot of practical experience go wrong is they think that the, the VC or this investor is going to be so overjoyed to have this great idea that they're just going to start writing checks. Why do they think that? Because they heard about Google, you know, they heard about Larry and Sergio, or I forget the second guy's name, sorry, Sergey, I think his name is, you know, flying from, you know, from, I think Stanford, hey, who cares? They, they went to the investor, geez, I'm trying to, you know, be all exact, you know, and the guy writes them a check for $100,000 and they didn't even have, a, you know, they weren't incorporated, they misspelled Google, you know, it was actually supposed to be the, you know, G-O-G-U-L or whatever. So they think, well, look, these guys did it and they didn't have, you know, they had nothing. Well, yeah, except you know, there was already a lot of other stuff done and, you know, they had more than an idea. They actually had a patentable, patentable idea, right? So there was more stuff in the background and that's what people miss, right? So unless you've got something like that, which is rare, you have to admit, you're going to be better off going through that exercise because then when you talk about the leaks and pouring in money and how fast the, the VC's BS detector isn't going to be going off. They're going to know, and they may even ask you, well, how did you come up with that? You could tell them, well, I heard this crazy guy, Maceo, and he get, you know, you could say that, or you could just say, look, I, I wanted some way to model the flow of money before I actually had money coming in. But mm. every VC that I've ever known would give their left arm to have a line of entrepreneurs that had done that. Because at the very least, you're going to to know what you it means you've thought about all the leaks that are in the business, you've thought about how much money. And you've probably gone through a couple, like if it's an ounce is 100,000 every second, it's like, okay, that's not enough. 200,000, 300,000, 400,000. Well, I'm going to have to spend a million dollars every quarter just to keep this thing going. Well, you know, that's much different information than just thinking, well, you know, hey, if we had 5 million bucks, we could make it work. Well, maybe. Right. But how do you, you know, so then the VC is thinking, okay, maybe, but why, right? They get that, like, I've got slant eyes, right? I'm sort of looking at you, sort of looking at, give you the side eye, like, okay. You know, so if you if you start to see that the the, the VC is giving you the side eye, that's why because you're not you're not um, with nonverbal and verbal communication speaking to them in a way that they know that you have some experience. So to cap all that off, and you know, I think I think we were talking about this on the intro call about the selection process. Yeah, the reason why VCs have to be select is they have to have speed. And it, so my business, my business scaled, right? That, that was done to us. It was right time, right place, right time. I knew the trend to get into. I was able to take that initial scaling, apply it to some growth in a couple of other areas and scale it again. You know, our first exit was around 280 million. Uh, second one was around 420. So today's money would be like six something. So 600 million today. But back then it was about 400 million uh, for the second exit. Um, all of that, all of that was, was, it was able to happen because I'd already gone through those selection processes. Right? So a VC either wants that where I've quote proven it or like we were talking, is it the education? Well, if you go through Stanford or MIT, yeah, it's a selection process. I mean, you, you know, you can't be barely able to fog a mirror and get in. You've <laughs> got to be able to keep up with the work, right? So they at least know something about you, but they want all of that because they need you. They need to invest in you and then exit out of their entire portfolio inside of their investment cycle, which is usually five, maybe seven years. So they have this redefined limit. So what they need to know is that when you're making decisions, they're less likely to go from those little pinpricks. So you use a pinprick, right? Those are small holes. Well, then get a nail and then go get your kitchen knife and jab that into the side, right? So a, a big dumb decision would be you jab the kitchen knife into the side of it. Yeah. Now you're looking at it like, okay, now fill that in. When you mix all that together, that's the real reason why a lot of these capital markets are closed. Because if you're not communicating at least a basic understanding of that, like if I keep jabbing this thing with, with kitchen knives, we're going to have a problem. Right. Yeah. I love all of your examples. I mean, you're 
they're so simple, but we don't, we don't think about things that are simple in simple ways most of the time. Yeah, we overcomplicate it. <laughs> All the time. Oh, especially in what we're talking about. I mean, just listen to how, you know, especially venture capitalists talk about, you know, these ac- all the acronyms and all the jargon it's, it's you know again i blame it on my physics background is we is that we've got to be able to communicate something so that people can understand and legend has it albert einstein actually says if you can't communicate an idea simply you just don't understand it well enough and i so i heard that a long time ago and on top of that i've i've taught for a long time i started teaching martial arts in in high school and believe me when you're teaching somebody you know how to move their body to either stop someone from injuring them or to injure somebody else, you need to break down very complicated stuff in simple ways. But I also have trained myself because of that to think about things like, how could I teach that to somebody? And so often, we we, we being people, we're, we're more interested in sounding smart than we are giving somebody something that they could take really whole hog, just take it right from you and then go do something with it. That goes back to martial arts. Like you can't in that world teach somebody theory, right? It's got to be usable. I had a, a reminder that we were training some special forces guys. There were these two dudes that were doing something. I went over there with an idea like, hey, why don't you try this? And the guy said, okay, let me do it to you. And I actually stopped for a second. And he was like, right. you know, he's waiting. So he was testing me, right? So what, what they learned on the special forces team is like, okay, you've got a great idea. You do it. I'm going to see you blow your hand off. Or I'm going to see you break your elbow, which actually he almost broke my wrist is what happened. And he was kind enough to stop. And it was, and I was like, yeah, that's not going to work. He's like, yep. And he just walked off and went along. So it's, I've had these, I've had the, the great fortune to not only have those lessons, but have them in a way where I really did want to be able to communicate them to other people. Where yeah. so often, you know, it's more, you know, again, going back to beating up on my, my favorite, my favorite punching bags, the Sinex and Robbins of the world, you know, they're, they're running a business. You know, and so when you're in the business of teaching people, it behooves you to teach them stuff that is complicated because then, you know, you get to explain it again or sell them something else to explain when it's, yeah, it's really just not that complicated. And in business, you've got to get to doing stuff as quickly as possible. And, you know, unfortunately, especially for people that maybe are a little bit shy or a little bit nervous, that can be tough. And so what I try and do is give people baby steps that they can do to gain the confidence or just to overcome, like I started talking about, all those fear signals, which believe me, can be very powerful, but baby steps to get over those. So it's not that it's not that you've got to be afraid of, well, how am I going to feed my family? Because that may be a big deal, right? Where you're thinking about how can I go from zero to feeding my family? Well, let's let's go to zero to filling a bucket with some water, right? Let's let's start with that. Yeah. And then labeling all the things that are going to cost you money in this business. You can just sit around and think about that. Well, yeah. that's you don't have to be afraid of that because you're doing it's in your house. You don't even have to tell somebody why you're, well, much not going to ask you, Hey, are, are you going to use this for your new business? <laughs> what kind of business is it? What are you going to be selling? They're just, they're going to sell you the dang bucket. You know what I mean? You, right. And you can get your kids involved and it can be fun. So it's so many of the people that I, that I trained in, in trading were so fearful of the markets that they never, they never actually traded. And I found that out the hard way. I was trading at a hedge fund. I mean, I was making that fund probably a hundred thousand a month. The market was just really active at the time. And so the opportunity cost for me to go teach these people was pretty high, right? I, I could have been doing something else like in that other arena. Yeah. And I'm only giving some context to, to put some meat behind that. Like there was a real cost for me training them. And I've been doing it for about six months. I wasn't asking any money. It was doing it because they asked. And then one day somebody said, oh, you know, blah, 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 my paper trading. I was, I was like, whoa, wait a minute, what? <laughs> I finally said, okay, everybody stop. Who here is actually trading? And they all raised their hand. Who here is paper trading? They all raised their hands. I was like, well, who here actually has money in an account? Everybody was doing this, looking around. And I just said, look, I can't do that. Like, I'm not going to come here just so you can paper trade. I said, you got two weeks. If in two weeks, half of you haven't started actually trading, I'm out. Now, I was younger at the time and f- far more aggressive, as you can tell. And so, you know, I could have I could have walked them into it. Where I developed that walking into it strategy was after coaching you know, thousands and thousands of people, you know, I figured out, okay, this is not, this is not uncommon. So the, I know I've been talking for a long time. I apologize. So I'll no, cap it off with this. Right. It's perfect. Mm-hmm. I'll cap it off with this. What, so I've, I, I've, I've been ranked in martial arts. You know, I took uh, second and third in the state games for martial arts. I made it through special forces selection. 
you know, I've done things that just by their nature, few people can do. And so as a result of that, what I've come to realize is there are some people that just can do that. And there are some people that can't. So yeah. in special forces selection, there were all kinds of guys, ranger battalion, infantry, mountain, blah, blah, blah. You know, they had all this stuff and they were dropping like flies. And I didn't. Now at the time, you know, my ego kicked in and I, of course, strutting around, having more maturity and more grace for people. What I realized is everybody has their limit. Yeah. And unfortunately, what winds up happening is that the people who, for whatever reason, naturally, osmosis, hard work, they've got a higher limit they typically get held up as the example, right? And so what I think we fail to realize is how big the gap is from where most people are and somebody who's on the stage. So take a Gary V. There's no denying the guy, there's no denying his skills. You know, I'm not trying to say, you know, that, you know, the guy's a, a fake. No, not, not at all. I will pick on him for some of the things that he says. But I think what we fail to realize is the gap from him to the average person in the audience. Not that that gap can't be crossed, but just that that's not the best place to look, man. I mean, you're, you're yeah. looking at somebody who has go, been doing things for a long time. And you know we have to remember his agency does social media. So of course he's going to tell you to get on social media, you know, do his 60 posts a day or whatever it is thing. I, I always poke fun at because that's ridiculous. It's like, yeah, you, I want to see Gary do that personally. Not as 60 people that are, you know, behind the camera that you never see. And there are 60, six, zero, him, him personally sit there and do the stuff and put a camera on it. I want to see that because- And still run a profitable business. Well, that's it. And then show me the results. Like, I want to see you track the results of that. Now, am I just poking at Gary V? Yeah, a little bit. I got to admit it. I'm just poking at Gary. V. My, my, my friends always call, you know, say, why are you such a player hater? I'm not a player hater. It's just, I don't put people up on a pedestal. So uh, what I'm trying to impart in people is a little bit of that, right? So let, you know, take whoever you've got on a pedestal, understand that there is a huge gap. I mean, it's a gap that's even bigger than what most people would realize between where they are and where that person on the pedestal is. Then as best as you can, figure out all the steps that they went through. And that's one thing that I really appreciate, appreciate about Gary is he makes no bones about it. When he was growing his business, he's like, I didn't go on vacation. I, my, kid, my friends were going you know, to the beach. I didn't go to the beach. I went from work to home, back to work. I didn't go to the movies. I didn't have an Xbox. I didn't you know, have a Blockbuster membership. I worked. So when, when I was you know, coming up as a hedge fund trader, it was the same thing. I woke up at four o'clock in the morning uh, I drove to the gym, got there usually around 4.30, worked out. It was like a hit style workout. So really short, very intense because I wanted to get to work. I roll into the office no later than five o'clock. I mean, that was, I had to wake up and get all that crap done in an hour so I could literally be sitting at my desk at 5 a.m. I left the brokerage firm no earlier than four most days. Sometimes on a Friday, I may leave, you know, I might leave a little bit earlier. Now, if there was traffic, sometimes I'd stay later. So I'd stay till six o'clock. So they had to give me an alarm code. I actually told the owner of the firm, I said, look, I'm either going to be here every day opening this door and setting off the alarm, or you can give me a code. But I'm going to be the first person here. I'm going to be the last person to leave. Why did I do that? One of my mentors told me, I said, oh, the secret to success is simple. Be the first person there, the last person to leave. So I took him in his word. And so over time, when you work that hard, it's not just that you figure it out. What winds up happening is that the people around you that are watching you see it. And I can, I'm telling you, I have yet to run into a successful person that sees somebody working hard consistently that will refuse to help them. I've never seen it. And I, I mean, yeah. Bill Gates, or Steve Jobs, pick Rockefeller back in the day, pick your, you know, whoever, when they see that, they always help. Now, it may not be that they're going over there personally, but I guarantee you they're picking up the phone, yeah. you know, hey, Smithers, tell me about that guy. Who is that guy? You need to keep your eye on that guy or that gal, it, that is what opens the door. Absolutely. But what we wind up hearing from the stage is a little bit different. You know, it's, it's that it is more complicated that more to what you were saying, Jasmine. It's like, well, if you, yeah, it's hard work and, you know, fill in the blank, whatever they're selling PS, you know, whatever's in their book or their, you know, their Udemy course. If, if, if you just start there and you put yourself in a place where other successful people are working and you're working hard, the assistance will show up. So what that means is if somebody's working in a job, um, I would say stay there. Like if going back to what, what 
uh, I think you were saying like 70, 80,000 a year, um, something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So somebody, if, if they're thinking, okay, I've got this job, maybe I should leave and, and go do the entrepreneur thing. I would say, why don't you first do this? Say, okay, six months from now, I'm going to do that. And for those six months, the first week, I'm going to look around at, at, and find people that I would want to mentor me in this organization. I'm going to find out what their schedule is. And then I'm going to make sure that they know I'm coming in. For, I mean, pick your earliest time. If it's six, show up at five. And you, then go, say, go to them and say, look, I need, to, I need to be here at five. I don't feel like I'm getting enough in. So, you know, can you give me a code? Can I, you know, can I do something? Make sure they know. And then for those six months, I mean, you don't want to, you know, the New Testament says you don't want to trumpet this stuff. So you don't want to make it overt, but then put in the work and make sure that they can see you. And I only say that to test what I'm telling you. Yeah. And at the end of that six months, then you decide to go out on your own, one, and two, go to that person that you, that you said in the beginning you wanted mentorship from, who should have been seeing you doing all that hard work, first, first in, last out, and tell them, you know what? I think I've got this great opportunity. I want to pursue it. I'd really like it if, you know, if I could call on you. you know, I know I'm going to be leaving, but I could use your advice. I'd really like your help in your feedback and test me, see what they say. Yeah. That's an awesome piece of advice. They it might, really is. yeah, they might try to give you a promotion before you leave to incentivize you to stay. Well, now, I know I would. <laughs> you just, you just called, you just called me out. So what, what a lot of people miss is the secret to a raise. And I know we're talking about entrepreneurship, but the secret to a raise, the secret to getting more money, the secret to getting clients, by the way, is showing value. So way back Way back in the beginning uh, of my career uh, in marketing, I would, uh, I, I date myself so often. You do know what the yellow pages are, right? Yeah, yeah. I do. Okay, good. <laughs> people, I might be able to don't even know what that is. Like, yellow pages. All right, so for those people who don't know, the yellow pages, pre-internet, were these huge books that were literally yellow with all, all the businesses that were willing to pay them to be in the book. So I would go through the book, tear out people's yellow pages ads, and then tell them how to improve it, and then just mail it to them. So what was I doing? I was showing them value. Now, yeah, other people have said that, but here, here's how to really make that work. Send them two or three more of the same ad, by the way. So it's the ad with suggestions. Uh, you know, I would even tear out another one and say, hey, here's, here's another way to do it. You know, these people are really successful, but it's, it's the follow-up. It's, you know, it all comes back to the work. So if, if you're trying to get clients or if, let's say you're, you're at a job and you can have a side hustle, instead of just randomly doing stuff, figure out how to go to your buyer and show them value first. So back to my, you know, my epiphany as an eight-year-old or something, those ladies already had those bird feeders. What I was selling them was more pleasure from having more birds in their yard. I wasn't selling them a bird feeder. I didn't realize that at the time, of course, I was eight. I'm not going to, I'm not going to claim to be a savant, but looking back on it, that's, ex that value was the birds being there. It wasn't in the thing that I was selling. That, ex the, that experience taught me that, right? So what, we're, what most people miss about trying to sell their product is they're leading with the thing. Uh -huh. so they, they, they lead with the object. So I'm going to sell them a new microphone or a new car. Look, somebody buys a Rolls Royce probably because like a valet insulted them and they want the valet like, whoa, this guy's got a Rolls. It's just it's as simple as that. It's an emotional thing, especially if it's a dude. The dude definitely wants other people to be like, whoa, you know, bowing and scraping. I mean, that's like every guy wants to be a king, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so if you're selling cars, if you if you can help your client feel like a king and they wind up feeling like a king, they're probably going to buy the stupid car, right? Because that's the value that they want. So the by demonstrating value, to, I know I just jumped around a lot there, except we're running short on time. So I'm trying to fit a whole lot in. But if, if somebody's in a job and they're thinking about exiting, using that technique of ripping out the ad, or you could print off somebody's webpage and please don't email them. Because here's a simple example. Jasmine, for your anniversary, would you want Joseph to send you an email of flowers? Would you want him to send you an email of a great vacation? Even if there were great photos, how about a video? He could send you a 4K video of the beach. Nope, I... I physical <laughs> ridiculous right so what so what we miss in this digital world is people still respond to that physical thing and so 
absolutely implore somebody, if you are going to test these ideas, send a physical thing in the mail. If you, if you're, if you want to get in, uh, you know, somebody at the C level, CEO, CTO, CMO, send them a FedEx. We've tested it. I've, I mean, I and people I've worked with have sent out thousands of these packages. FedEx will absolutely make it onto somebody's desk. The only other thing you could do if you're sending it to a mail is put it in a, uh, like a card sized envelope with a pastel color, get a woman to address it and then put some perfume on it. <laughs> I, I guarantee you that is going to be on the top of his desk when he comes in in the morning. Right. Cause there's a suit that's going to be one like, okay, here you go. Who's that? Right. So it's, it, it's the physicality of the thing, right? It's yeah. the emotion that it evokes. Uh, you know, too often, you know, we, we forget that we're, we're highly emotional beings. And whenever you can make that emotional connection to you, your product, it's going to, it's going to, uh, it's going to do some things for people that an email or something else wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I'll cap it all off with this. So I, I started off talking about energy and, you know, how businesses you get energy in and scaling happens to you and, and all of that. When you can make somebody have a burst of emotion it creates a burst of literal energy in their brain. And when you, when you study what that does physically in the brain, it literally creates a stronger connection. Mm -hmm. And I mean that like in a physical way, the dendrites, the neurons, all of that physical machinery is thicker, it's more efficient. Well, if, if you or your business are involved in that connection, then when they do finally meet you, it's a stronger connection. I mean, isn't that really what we're, we're talking about? Connecting with people and connecting people with products. And so when I say, you know, great marketing that, you know, connects people and products, it's, it's with all of that in mind. And so the, 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 the system that I'm talking about, it, it's doable by anybody, it's accessible by anybody. And even if you do have an, just an idea for a product, you can use some of these things. And if you think about it, it you know, just to launch or test it, or, you know, if you don't want to talk to somebody, how you could you could mail this to random people and still get a result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So, oh, did you, you want to? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we had to figure out who was going to say, ask the next question. So uh, we talked about a lot on this podcast episode and I absolutely loved it. I always love when I go into something thinking it's going to be one way and then it turns out to be another way. Mm -hmm. That's how this has been. And it's been awesome. And since you're on the Abundant Culture podcast, we feel the need to ask this question to everybody who comes on because we always get very unique and interesting answers. And the question is, whether it be in your personal life, in your business, or even in your spiritual life, how do you like to spread abundant? Oh, wow. So I, I do that in a couple of different ways. Um, so Jesus actually said, you know, give so your right hand doesn't know the left is doing it. So all of my money stuff, I never tell anybody about. So that, but that is one way. Um, but the, the rest is understanding that, you know, give and it will be given to you, uh, you know, in abundance yeah. is, is a real concept. And I've just seen so many times in my life where I've been able to share something with someone and see them get an outsized return for that. How then can I, you know, look in the mirror and complain about whatever is going on in the world, understanding that it really doesn't take a lot, that I can do something small, have this great positive effect on the world, and then not do it. So if I'm withholding that, then I have to look in the mirror and say, well, if, if the world's messed up, guess who's part of the problem? Right here, me. So it's with that realization that, um, you know, I, I give freely. And so I, the, I think that mentality is it, behind it maybe makes it more meaningful because just to say, well, I, you know, I give everything away. doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It, it is because I'm, I'm greedy for that positive return because I'm greedy for other people seeing benefit from it. I'm greedy for other people having abundance in their life as well. Amazing. I love it. Yeah. So for the person listening, they're probably wondering how they can get in contact with either you or your team for uh, maybe they just want to network. Maybe they want to see how they can work with you or whatever the case may be. So we are, we are raising money. So I, I do have to say that as a disclaimer. Then also I have to say, you know, none of this is to, you know, try to solicit for investments. Um, Connexia is the healthcare rollup that we're doing. Uh, that's in the home healthcare space. That's at connexia.com. 
And then if, you know, it's just general marketing or business or, you know, somebody's interested in understanding how to talk to VCs, then that's probably best at maceojordan.com. Because on my, on my personal side, that goes right to me. The Connexia site, obviously, you know, that's going to go to, I don't even know who that's going to now, actually. It might be going to Sherry. <laughs> But, you know, she may not know what to do with that. So you might get a little bit of pushback if you send it there. But if somebody wants to connect with me directly, maceojordan.com, if they want to see what I'm up to in the business world, uh, connectsia.com. I've also got a project I'm working on to uh, cancel Hollywood over at lore.tv. Oh, wow. Wow. That's interesting. We mm-hmm. got to look into that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Maceo, for coming on and giving us a wealth of knowledge and and things to really think about. I mean, yeah. the simplest things. So thank you again for coming on to the Abundant Culture Podcast. Yeah, you're welcome. Glad to be here. If you don't diversify your investment portfolio, you could end up losing it all. But most business owners don't know how to diversify to mitigate those risks. That's why we created this resource for you. This passive investing guide is a must-have if you're planning to invest in businesses. Don't hesitate. If you have more than 25 grand liquid, then you can't afford not to take advantage of this resource. Download the four reasons why in 2021 you need small businesses in your portfolio now by going to www.abundantculture.co forward slash guide. Thank you for listening to the Abundant Culture Podcast with Jazz and Joe. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe and leave an honest rating and review. And remember, we're ready to buy your business. So if you're ready to sell or passively invest in other small businesses, go to AbundantCulture.co for more information. We publish episodes every Friday, so we'll see you next week.